Okay, welcome back. Fourth of July week. Hope you're making plans for the weekend. And even more than that, I hope they work out for you. You never know. Best laid plans of mice and those others sometimes don't work. Here with us is a man who always has a plan. He is Webster Griffin Tarpley, our greatest living historian. And I'm always honored to have Webster on the program as a friend. But more than that, as a great resource for all of you to help understand, even if you don't agree, to get a better slant on things. Remember, the the game here is to think. Even if you disagree, the game is to engage in the process. Welcome back, Mr. T. Thank you very much, Jeff. How are you? I'm uh, well, thank you. As uh, all things considered can be uh, distilled, I guess that's the best way I can phrase it. <laughs> well, um that which it is now the middle point of the year and um God, is it ever we're, did it, uh, would it last about three, of, three months and it's here <laughs> uh, big events and um maybe we can treat some of them however before we continue i would like to talk mainly about domestic us tonight for a change but right. before we do we have to we have to mark this uh, 100 years since the beginning of world war 1 or in particular since the Sarajevo assassinations of uh, the Archduke and the uh, and his wife. Which happened and one year after the uh, U.S. Congress passed the Federal Reserve Act, interestingly enough. Yes. Uh, I don't know what in particular to make of that, except the, well, the one thing you can make of it is that the, the, the events leading up to World War II bear the, the imprint of uh, Freemasonic lodges, uh, a, a tremendous campaign Mm -hmm. by British-centered Freemasonic lodges, and some French ones, but it's the the so-called Grand Orient, or Grand Orient, Uh uh, which was the center of French, uh, the the sort of uh, Anglophile French Freemasons, and then on the the British side, we had the, uh, naturally, the York Rite and the Scottish Rite, but we also had these special ones, like the Quatuor Coronati Lodge, the four crowned heads, who were two two people from from ancient his uh, four people from ancient history, and this was headed up or, or dominated by King Edward the Seventh. So mm-hmm. the the leader of this Freemasonic coalition, which gripped the world for for decades in the mm-hmm. in the latter part of the nineteenth century, was King Edward the Seventh of Britain, and it was of course the British policy to deal with the German challenge by resorting to war, that they they felt that they couldn't match Germany in terms of industry and progress and production. So therefore no, the they Germans were, they were, were leaving him in the dust, you're right. Agreed. Yeah. And the U.S. leaving uh, all of Europe in the dust, really. But uh, mm-hmm. in, the, in the case of Germany, they felt this was a, a military threat. So uh, the answer to this was a policy of encirclement. And this was pioneered by King Edward VII, who actually mm-hmm. conducted a personal diplomacy. The, the, the mechanism that, that went into motion in, uh, in late July of 1914 was this Entente, the Triple Entente of England, France, and Russia. That had been personally assembled by uh, King Edward VII, who had died mm-hmm. a couple of years before, but his... Uh, uh, his protégés, like Sir Edward Grey, the foreign minister, or Sir Jackie Fisher, the head of the Royal Navy, and, and many, many others. Sir Winston Churchill. Sir Winston Churchill's first job in government was to write a daily summary of what was going on in Parliament and send that to King Edward VII. So, and, and report this, back this to is Bernard, a shadow of evil. And report back to Bernard Baruch as well, uh, who bought him at least yeah, twice. But Bernard, look, we're, talking, we're talking apples and oranges. Bernard, Bar- You need a microscope to see Bernard Baruch compared you, to oh, I the agree. emperor of the world, King do Edward you, VII, right? you know, emperor of India. I have, I have not heard, Webster, anyone even utter the term triple entente in uh, 30 years. <laughs> Well, this is this is what when this is what what made World War One possible I know. because without right. it you couldn't you couldn't get the war. It's fascinating. In particular, the the insight was that you, without Russia you couldn't have a European war. And the uh, great uh, yeah. the great wisdom of Bismarck was to say we're going to have this so-called reinsurance treaty between Germany and Russia, which essentially said that there would be no war between Germany and Russia, mm-hmm. no matter what either country might do, whatever wars Russia might be in whatever wars Germany might be, and they would never line up one against the other. And that, of course, was thrown overboard by the 
unstable, erratic, uh, neurotic to psychotic uh, 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 Emperor William the second, but here the the thing that I wanted to just throw out here. We maybe we talk about this as as the as these anniversaries go go forward now because yeah. we'll be living through World War One anniversaries uh-huh. for the next five years, right? Yeah. And Versailles anniversaries and all a lot sorts of, dead of anniversaries. Uh, yes, well, a lot of history. The the weight of the uh, past generations weighs like a nightmare on the brain of the living. But here we go. Uh, this is a little story about a guy called. Clarence Henry Norman. Now, this is not Sir Montague Norman of the Bank of England. This is Clarence Henry Norman of the Independent Labor Party, which was a sort of a maverick political formation. They were against the war in World War I, and they also they asserted their independence from the, uh, from the Labor Party in a number of ways, hence the name. So these were, uh, the, you know, unpredictable... Uh, people but they were they they wanted to be guided by principle. So here we have this guy Clarence Henry Norman and we have to remember that the time frame we're talking about goes from June 28th 1914 that's the assassination in Sarajevo to July 28th mm-hmm. 1914. That's mm-hmm. where we get the uh first declarations of war between no uh Austria and uh, and Serbia. Right Although the it. British the British also mobilized their fleet. Bef- the British are the first to mobilize before anybody, if you count mobilizing the fleet, which in mm-hmm. their case is what counts most. So here's uh, Clarence Henry Norman says he walks, he's, he's, it's a, a Sunday in, um, in England, I think, and he, he says he's walking down the, the Strand in central London, and he meets uh, some influential people. He meets a guy who is uh, a, a top uh, uh, liberal activist of the Liberal Party, and the guy asks him, "Have you heard any news from Sarajevo? Have you heard the news from any news from Sarajevo?" And he's surprised, and he says, "I don't. What is, where, what's Sarajevo? I've never heard of Sarajevo. Where is it? What is it?" And it turns out this, of course, is this, this town in. Uh, in Bosnia, and then this, this this liberal guy that he's talking to, very distraught, goes off saying, is it possible that they screwed up? Is it possible that they blew it? So he rushes off in, in uh. complete uh, disarray. Mm-hmm. And, of course, the news doesn't come until later. Right? It comes in, in the afternoon mm. that the two uh, successors to the, the Vienna, the throne of Vienna and, and of Budapest have been, uh, have been killed by this guy, Prinkip. And then Later in the afternoon, the same guy, Norman, goes to a, uh, a salon, a rich uh, a person's uh, home where they're going to have tea, mm-hmm. and this is somebody connected to the Northcliffe uh, newspapers and other uh, important British newspapers, and the hostess who's uh, serving the tea, uh, and there are some top-level uh, British uh, newspaper people and other influentials there, and the uh, the hostess says, but, you know, by the way, this of course is the signal for the great European war that we've been uh, we've been talking about for so long, right? This is now, this is it. This is uh, at four o'clock in the afternoon. Now, that's a very remarkable statement because the quality of July 1914, and we're now in July uh, 2014. The, the the agreement of most contemporary observers is that there's a dreamlike quality of unreality and the inability to grasp that something horrendous is about to occur. There is a new book about this called The Sleepwalkers. And I don't agree with much in this book, but this, the idea of calling it The Sleepwalkers, I think at least captures this as far as the average person is concerned. Most of Europe were indeed people sleepwalking into a world catastrophe. Now, at the higher level, of course, when, they get, when we get to Sir Edward Gray and, and Sir Jackie Fisher and some others, you'll see that this is not this, the case. They want is, war, and they're going to yeah, get war. Yeah. This is not... You're not saying denial. You're saying people who are sleepwalking or oblivious. That the so, average schmo doesn't know what's yeah. happening and often uh, lapses into a mood of, of Pollyanna-ish uh, illusion. Hey, weird. Keep going. We're going to keep going. Go ahead. So that may be my question at, at some of these strategic forums, right, at the U.S.-Russia forum in the, uh, in the Hart Senate building. I asked, uh, 
ambassador Jack Matlock, who had been the U.S. ambassador to Moscow under Reagan, mm-hmm. and on the whole, not not the worst guy among the State Department veterans. Um, are we in July 1914? He said he didn't think we were, but we may well be. That is, with you, when you look at this um, this stuff in uh, in Ukraine, let me just just point out about that. One one of the speakers was uh, Stephen Cohen, the professor of Soviet studies, married to Katrina Vanden Heuvel of the nation. This the nation has actually tried to to do some kind of constructive work in calling attention to this danger. Right? But Cohen's opinion is that uh, well, it, it, you can also verify it that that there's tremendous pressure on Putin to declare a no-fly zone in Ukraine and suppress the the um, the bombing of civilians by the Ukrainian uh, Air Force and and by, especially by the right sector. Right. The, the, what they, they do that on the ground, right? They're, they're, they're well, they supposedly they only them. have one small battalion of official right sector people. There's a lot of mercenaries involved. Hundreds allegedly killed today, as opposed to only five Ukrainian dead. But you can't believe those statistics, as we know I, I, the yeah, game. We the, know the, the, game. the Ukrainian um, forces were characterized by you know, refusal to, to engage and then ineptitude. So I, I can't get into it at that detail, right? But I just I would just point to the fact that this is extremely dangerous. The other point that uh, that Cohen wanted to go into was the danger of tactical nuclear warfare in the in the Ukrainian situation. Now, I, that's this is essentially what I've been saying for ten years. Since the color revolution, the orange revolution of uh, November 2004, I've tried to point out that this is the most dangerous place in the world because it's really the only place where two nuclear armed forces could collide. That is the Russian forces who have lots of nuclear weapons and NATO forces, Polish, typically Polish NATO troops coming in that would expect to be given the U.S. Uh, nuclear umbrella. So that's... Uh, that's what you have going on. So anyway, mm-hmm. these books, let me just remind you now. The guy's name is Clarence Henry Norman, and one of his books is called A Searchlight on the European War. Mm. And he, this, these books were suppressed by the British during World War I. Anything he wrote was suppressed. He was harassed. He was, uh, he was uh, put away for a while by Lord Cave. How about Lo- Lord Cave was the Home Secretary? So they actually put him away. Send you, yeah. huh? They actually put him away. They mm. put him away for a while. Sure, the British, mm. these, you know, what are they called? The uh, Q notices or whatever they are. D. They they simply say this this article cannot appear. It's He's D got another notice. book called some yeah D notice. There we go. Some secret influences behind the European war. So um, the the point about all this is, as we go now through the coming months, there's going to be a lot of blathering by pseudo-historians who are going to try to tell you, and indeed this has already started, right, that the, of course, Germany is responsible, and the the war guilt clause of Versailles, whatever else we want to say about it, it does not hold up. It is not uh, tenable uh, concerning Germany having the sole guilt for World War I. I would say much more accurate would be to say the Freemasonic networks of King Edward VII of Great Britain and this includes the British government of that point. It includes people like uh, like Poincaré in France, Clemenceau in France. It includes Théophile Delcassé, another top uh, French diplomat, the Cambon brothers, C-A-M-B-O-N. But it also includes Izvolsky and Sazonov on the Russian side. And it includes... Um, any number of other people, right? Um, and I, I would also point to another another guilty party is Count Berchtold of the uh, of the Austrian government, who mm-hmm. who seems to he, the difference is that Berchtold wanted a regional war; he wanted Austria to crush Serbia. But the people in Britain and France and you know, the same people in Russia, in other words, this this British centered Freemasonic network that reached across. The world they wanted an all-out continental and world war, not just a regional war. And in the middle of all this, you have the pathetic Kaiser, right? The pathetic Emperor of Germany, who is simply he's in, he's incapable of comprehending. He's simply do, do we, too too weak mentally. Right? Do, do we see international banking involved in this? Uh, and if so, how? Yeah, of course, of course. 
I mean, what, what have I just said, right? It, it, international, British-centered Freemasonic networks with King Edward the Seventh, and the, the banks are simply, you know, they're they're one, the assets of this. Uh, this uh, I wonder who's an asset of whom, but uh, point well taken. Well, uh, for King Edward the Seventh, it was very clear when he gave, he would give his. Uh, he had a certain amount of assets, right? He would give this to bankers, uh-huh. and he'd say, "All right, fine. If you manage my." Assets, you're, you'll be admitted at the court, and they all wanted to be at the court. But then he said, "By the way, if there are losses, you will eat the losses. If there are profits, I will collect <laughs> the profits." That was the deal, yeah. and that's all these. That's Rothschild, Castle, uh, all of them. Every well, one uh, of them had to accept that deal. Heads I win, tails you lose. That's right. Uh, so, that's that's where it came from. Uh, Clemenceau, I haven't heard about for years. The Tiger, yeah, he another. Character. These, were, a whole these bunch of were British uh, assets. These were people who were, you know, variously obsessed with Germany or uh, Alsace Lorraine or whatever. Mm-hmm. Naturally, nobody with any brains ever considered war over the actual issue of Alsace Lorraine. Mm-hmm. But for the British, this again, the, the British line concerning Germany was: there are no conflicts of interest. There's only a general rivalry uh, for world domination. So that was that mm-hmm. was what it was, and. Uh, I mean, you can find all kinds of uh, literature about the um, the assassination of Franz Ferdinand, and that is to say, he his his idea was Franz Ferdinand wanted to take the dual monarchy of Austria Hungary, and he wanted to make it into a triple monarchy by allowing the creation of a South Slav kingdom. In other words, what would have been Yugoslavia with equal rights with the others. Sure. And this, of course, was blocked by the Hungarians, by the mm-hmm. Magyars, because mm-hmm. they would have been the ones out of whose territory that would have been carved. Mm-hmm. But Franz Ferdinand had married a Czech countess, a Czech woman, so he was taking position for the South Slavs, and he wanted to reduce the power of the Magyars, who were very oppressive, very backward landowners over huge areas that were inhabited by Slovenes and Romanians and all sorts of others. Oh, and the, the Magyars, of course, were a, a minority in their own country, so they had to be very, very oppressive. So he wanted to have, instead of dualism, he wanted to have what's known as trialism. Now, whether that would have uh, ever amounted to anything is anybody's guess, but the idea was that he was some kind of a reformer. And you have to also remember that the assassinations, it's not just one assassination, it's quite a few. And of these others, there's an attempt to kill Rasputin already in the summer of 1914. Rasput, the, the actual assassination of Rasputin is in December of 1916 yeah. by Prince Yusupov. Right? He was tough is, as nails, Rasputin. Prince Yusupov is a homosexual lover of King Edward VII personally. Okay? Wonderful. <laughs> and this Yusupov was one of the richest people in Russia, and leads us in all sorts of interesting directions. But the idea was oh, God. the Western, British were uh, convinced. The British were convinced mm-hmm. that Rasputin was an agent of the Central Powers, mm-hmm. and he was pro-German. And there was something to this, although of course he was also a a monster. So there was an attempt to kill him. And the other assassination, which I would I would point to, uh-huh. is the assassination of Jean Jaurès, J A U R E S, right. with a little accent on the uh, the the latter E. Mm-hmm. And this was a French socialist. Uh, you remember the, the Socialist International had pledged that if a war broke out, the socialist parties would all vote no money for the war. And Jaurès was somebody who said, that's what we're going to do. Mm-hmm. We're going to say, down with the war, down with the ruling mm-hmm. class, not one penny, not one man no for this bloodbath. And he was assassinated yeah. in the street. So this you. was the, the power of this Freemasonic uh, combination. How things have changed, but you said something really early on. It was a little kind of a quotation about how history lands on our heads. What was that you said? Do you remember that? What, a long time ago? Tonight. The, 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 no, pain, I, I, the pain of history or something lands on our heads. Well, we, a, can just, we can go back and listen to the recording, I'm sure. I guess we can. It was a very, very slick right. little statement. But now I, I, we, we have to deal with this as, as it goes along, right? And there, there's a lot to be said about it, right? Because and this is going to lead to us somehow to Mr. Sass, 
I guess, uh, later yeah, on. Yeah, I hope so, because what I would like to really talk about tonight, now we spent half the program on this other stuff, I wanted to talk about domestic and about, about a couple of things, right? The first thing is about this Nebraska Senate race, and I want to make an appeal to everybody to do whatever you can to help my friend Dan Burdorf, B-U-H-R-D-O-R-F, and this is danfornebraska.com, mm-hmm. running for United States Senate in Nebraska mm-hmm. as the Tax Wall Street Party. Just the idea of having the Tax Wall Street Party on yeah. the ballot should excite everybody. The but we also have tax. a fine candidate, an excellent candidate, mm-hmm. uh, very, very uh, competent, mature, uh, tremendous political uh, instincts, and uh, I think it would be a real, a real plus. Uh, and um, he is taking on the establishment of Nebraska. Now, of course, this is a very unsavory matter, right? So we just, I would just you know, sort of allude to it because most of the stuff you've been kind enough to put on your fine uh, website, right? Wayne Madsen has now spent some time out in Nebraska. Yeah. And as a result of Wayne's travels and interviews out there, there's going to be more coming. But in particular, uh, he's got... You know, the, the the he's revisiting the scandal of, of, of you know eight, of about 1990, 1989-90, uh-huh. uh, and also then how this scandal lives on in the form of this guy Ben Sass. Well, uh, Wayne is always welcome here, and I appreciate you. In fact, tell him thank you for me because uh, I really like to post his material. He's uh, he's a quite an extraordinary reporter and researcher. So oh, you should so invite him directly. Oh, he's, he's very busy. He's been on before, but yeah, I should. Uh, okay, hold on, Webster. We'll be right back and uh, take a little closer look at uh, Benjamin Sass in a minute. Okay, and we're back with Webster. Here he is on uh, election night, May 13th, uh, 2014. Let's see if we can uh, get some audio here. I'm not sure if I'll be able to. Is this Sass? Yeah, we should hear the uh, target here. I'm not getting anything. Go ahead. Tell us more about Dan. I, I think that the the importance is, uh, well, um, we, we, I'd I'll, I'll like to talk about some issues in just a minute. Right? Uh, but uh, the the question now about SAS is that this this gets very ugly. And um, this this really, it, 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 in some ways, it goes beyond issues. It's an issue of character. Um there's this very ugly establishment out there, right? And there was this this story with the uh, the Franklin Savings and Loan and Lawrence King, and the question of child molestation, pedophilia, and uh, important uh, personalities in the state being involved in that in that uh, scandal. Yeah, I was, uh, that's a, that's one of the biggest uh, covered up stories of, right. of our so time, was frankly. Wayne right. Madsen went out there and and sort of you know looked at the cold case files and yeah. uh, and found that a lot of the people were still around and oh, a lot of yeah. the issues were still around and oh, yeah. um in particular his finding was that at, at a certain point in that scandal the state of Nebraska had hired an investigator by the name of Gary Caradori mm-hmm. and Gary Caradori had flown in a private plane from Nebraska to Chicago to go to a baseball with game with his kid and with his child and had come back with a uh, a briefcase filled with uh, very important documents that bore on this pedophile child molestation he had photos ring. he had everything according to what he said and they, and they and actually then found the plane photos crashed. And- they found photos in the wreckage. The FBI went over it with a vacuum cleaner, and it all disappeared. Right, right, exactly. And now what, what Wayne Manson has added to that charge is that the, he, he now accuses the FBI of having bombed the plane. That is, the uh, FBI murdered, I li- liquidated Gary Caradori, his wouldn't, son. Wouldn't and surprise me in the least, Webster. This evidence. Here's, uh, here's, so a little, here's a little quickie with Sass. Go ahead, finish up, and I'll play a little bit. Well, the, the the question with SAS, to, let's talk about SAS. Right? We, we now have a pattern of three separate instances in which SAS has, in effect, covered for pedophiles. Right? We don't know what he does himself at this point, but we certainly can say that he acts as a front man or an enabler or facilitator for this. One is when he was the page and proctor, one of four, of the House Republican pages, mm-hmm. 1994. 1996, I believe, and uh, 
That meant that during the time that uh, the infamous Mark Foley and and also this other character, Jim Colby, were actively molesting these children, Sass was the person who should have stopped it. The proctor means the person who watches over the students, right? He's supposed to be the... Uh, you know, the guardian. The He's, chaperone. Uh, what's right? Effect, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he failed in this, failed in this, failed big time, but somehow was never touched. Now we find there was, in the state of Nebraska, in the uh, the board that uh, handled the assignment of foster children to, to foster homes, mm-hmm. there was a woman called Stitt, S-T-I-T-T. And Mrs. Stitt was apparently some kind of a traditionalist, uh, and was very um, careful, tried to be careful, in keeping foster children out of homes where they might be threatened with sexual abuse. Mm-hmm. So she became a target mm-hmm. for some kind of pedophile uh, network. And the way that this worked was, it was found that Mrs. Stitt had attended some kind of a campaign meeting. Now, uh, she was then uh, thrown out of uh, her job on the, on charges connected to the Hatch Act. Now, the Hatch Act applies to federal employees, not mm-hmm. state. But the argument came down that the Nebraska Foster Children's Board, with Mrs. Stitt on it, had received federal money, and therefore, even though she really worked for the state, she had to conform to the Hatch Act, and she hadn't done so. Huh. The complaint for this came from... Health and Human Services in Washington, under Bush, at the same time that Ben Sass was the uh, the assistant secretary, I guess it was, of HHS, of the part of the bureaucracy there that issued this uh, complaint to Nebraska that cost Mrs. Stitt her job and apparently made it easier to get children into these terrible situations. So that's number two. And then number three, during the time of SAS at uh, Midland University, one of the coaches was uh, was arrested, simply arrested by the police for uh, sexually abusing students, children, and then also sort of farming them out, right, prostituting them, pimping them. Sounds to ten, other, ten state-ish, uh, yeah. Yeah, uh, a, a kind of a um, Sandusky. I think a lot more of that goes on than we would ever understand. Of, of Nebraska, right? Mm-hmm. So the mini Sandusky of Nebraska. But again, go back to Penn State. The president of Penn State lost his job, but not SAS. You see? The handling of SAS is very mm-hmm. different. Midland yeah. University, coach arrested, in jail. Ben SAS gets no he penalty. He was uh, being uh, groomed. Uh, sounds being like groomed. me. So, you got to do something about this. Now, so this is one, danfornebraska.com. The other one that I'd urge people to look at is uh, New York State, because this is always very important, needless to say, because this is where Wall Street is, and therefore it's, it's always something that we want to pay special attention to. The, the villainy of Andrew Cuomo is not sufficiently understood, right, because it, it has not been reported, right? Nobody seems to want to report it. Because the, the, the only way to, to approach him is that he's a Wall Street puppet who's, who's been um, you know, completely attacking the Democratic uh, base, attacking unions, attacking all the interest groups of the Democratic Party, and still thinking that he's going to run for president with all that Wall Street money. So now we have uh, the, the process for the, for the Democratic primary is now in, uh, in motion. And here I want to call people's attention to Randy Credico. Randy Credico ran for mayor of New York last autumn. He ran as a Democrat until the Democratic uh, primary in September. And then he became the tax Wall Street Party candidate for mayor and ran all the way to November on that. So he got out the word about the need to tax Wall Street, right, the Wall Street sales tax, which is coming to be the... Uh, the, the uh, the litmus test for anybody who wants to be considered a popular well, radical agree. candidate. Is it, is it still hanging around the one percent mark? One percent, sure. Okay. Well, I, that's the Tarpley tax. I'll Certainly not going is. down. Now, if people come forward and say they should pay the normal sales tax. I'm perfectly open to that. All right. Very good. Stand by. We'll come back in just a couple of minutes with Webster as we continue. Okay. Let's get right back to it. Uh, a couple of quick words from Ben Sass on primary election night, May the 13th. The political- 
class told us there was no way you could run a campaign based on the Constitution and proposing big, bold, conservative solutions at our town halls. And they didn't bet on us because they didn't know you. You're really <laughs> interested in passing on the meaning of America to the next generation. Yes. You told us that you want a united... Are you uh, had enough uh, there? Where he got his money. Uh, his his biggest contributors are New York banks, out of state banks, banks uh, of any kind, but principally out of state. You, most you know, of the money from out of state, and most of the money in large contributions, mm-hmm. not much in the way of the small stuff. Right? Not you the you know what's interesting? Stores. We're this is kind of deja vu for us. This is rather like you and I going after Obama nine and almost ten years ago. Well, eight or nine right, years. Exactly. Ago. It's, the difference is now. I think there, are, there, there, there's probably more than one uh, Manchurian candidate, but I think this guy Sass is certainly one of them. So, in other words, instead of having one principal deployment like Jimmy Carter, well, he's and been then a spare, absolutely groomed and like blah, blah, Askew. Yeah. If, instead of having Carter, Askew, and as a fallback, or Obama, and then Deval Patrick as a possible fallback, I think there are now several of these Manchurian candidates, and they may even be competing. They may be working in synergy or, or maybe not. But um, that would be sass. But uh, I wanted to just say a couple of words about, about Cuomo, right? There, there was something in New York called the bank tax, which was taxed specifically on banks, which Cuomo lifted. So he's demanding killer cuts, genocidal austerity for the people of New York State. And at uh-huh. the same time, he's specifically... Lightening the burden on these uh, uh, financier oligarchs. Who another down great the American. Jeez. The other thing is that New York State has what I call a Wall Street sales tax. It's mm-hmm. very small, mm-hmm. but they refund it. It is remitted oh, really? to the banks as a result of blackmail. Yes, how, how and that's thoughtful. been the case yeah. since the late 1970s, since the time of Governor Hugh Carey. I think it has to do with Wall Street saying we'll go to New Jersey uh, if you don't give us our uh, tax money back, but. Um, you get the idea. This this is an outrageous situation. So here, the candidate is this Randy Credico, colorful, unpredictable, but he's been fighting these interests for a long time, and particularly last year as the candidate of the Wall Street sales tax. So this is the Wall Street sales tax now personified, and his, his website is Credico 2014. Now, this is an interesting field. Because challenging Cuomo are primarily radical candidates um, from the left wing of the of the Democratic Party, and here there's this person Zephyr Teachout that you may have heard uh, of, right? She's no, a law that's professor. A classic name, Zephyr Teachout. Yes, um, there is this guy Terry Teachout who's a who's a reactionary, right? He writes for reactionary. They magazines. couldn't possibly claims, be related, could they? He claims no. He claims that they're not they're related. Not? I don't know, but I would say uh, this Zephyr Teachout is a <laughs> very weak, very diluted, very timid uh, approach to this entire uh, problem. Essentially, it's a petty bourgeois. Right. Left liberal. Well, kind they're of, up um, against a machine here, Cuomo. Come on. Yeah, but what? <laughs> I'm telling you, vote for Credico, somebody with guts, a fighter. He's up against the same machine, right? And he's not getting the publicity. The, the controlled media have agreed that Zephyr Teachout is the acceptable, respectable uh, alternative, alternative to Teachout. Yeah. I see. And I'm saying, screw that. Credico uh, is your man. Mm-hmm. He, again, he's colorful and unpredictable, but he's undoubtedly a fighter. Mm-hmm. And he has uh, d- done a lot for this. Uh, well, let's invite him on the idea. program. Break out and get yeah, him good. on. Bring good. Him on. Let's get him. Here, All we'll right. get him on. We'll get him on. And the I'm other, I would just mention, though, there's another guy, Howie Hawkins of the Green Party, mm-hmm. who has in the past called for New York State to stop refunding the Wall Street sales tax, such as they have it, to these uh, zombie banks. And H- Howie Hawkins, to his credit, is there should be open debates with Cuomo, with Hawkins, with Credico, and with Teachout. I think that would be worth worth looking at. And I wonder what Teachout says about having open debates. She apparently hasn't answered uh, uh, huh. on that. So um, well, we if don't we need can to get this guy more. on. Bring him on with you because you that would be really good to hear you interact with him. I think 
Very good. All right, fine. Any way, any way you want it, but I, I, I certainly, I, I'm, I'm sure that he'll accept. But now, look, concerning the uh, the general proposition, right? The strategy is destroy the Republican Party in place, split mm-hmm. the Democrats into two: a Wall mm-hmm. Street Party and a populist or pro labor party. Now, what we've had so far is a series of rolling epiphanies from the Republicans. Now, bear with me; I got to move fast. In the Brat Cantor affair. You saw that the Republicans hate Hispanics, right? They can't, they're xenophobic. They don't like immigrants of any kind. In the Thad Cochran affair in Mississippi, it was revealed that the uh, Tea Party candidate, McDaniel, is indeed a racist who wants to cut food stamps and cut federal aid to education, which in Mississippi is the only way you have any special education in that poverty-stricken state is because of federal payments, and Cochran had the sense to say that. But this taught everybody, once again, the Republican Party is profoundly racist. We've just had the Hobby Lobby decision. The Hobby Lobby decision yeah, takes yeah, us back yeah. to the days when the Lord of the uh, the Duke or the Count could tell his subjects well, the the peasants, the what religion exactly. they would have, right? Yep, yep, yep. And that, of course, uh, that's a neo-feudal decision that's completely unconstitutional, but that also shows the hatred of women by the Republicans, right? The way in which the Republicans responded to Hobby Lobby showed their profound misogyny. There is a war on women. This is it. Then we have the Export-Import Bank. This is extremely interesting. The byproduct of Cantor losing his seat is that it's, uh, there's now a grave danger that the Export-Import Bank will be wiped out uh, at the end of September. This would mean the immediate loss of approximately one quarter million U.S. jobs, and uh, these are some of the most uh, highly qualified jobs in technology. It's got to do with the export of aircraft, the yeah. export of yeah. generators. Well, these are upper General level jobs Electric. which we desperately need and can't afford. We desperately to lose. need them. Yeah. Everybody else has this. China, France, Germany, they all have mm-hmm. export import banks. They're all three, four, five times bigger than the one we have. The secret here is that the predator, Jeb Hensarling, Hensarling wants to become the Speaker of the House at the end of this year, depending on events. And Hensarling thinks that he can ride in on a wave of money from the Koch brothers and others. But in particular, this, this question, Hensarling, who's the head of the House Financial Services Committee, Hensarling declaring war on the Export-Import Bank raises the question of Chinese money. Is he getting Chinese money? Is he... The Maoist faction, the the Chai Com faction of the Republican Party on Capitol Hill. This is the the problem with the Citizens United, is that you don't know whether the money is foreign, right? You can't you can't tell. Dark pools come in, dark funds. My my contention is that Jeb Hensarling may be a Maoist agent, and I'm not kidding. That's literally the case. So you destroy the Export Import Bank, the the Chinese will be laughing, and producers in this country will be despairing. And then we have this riot today, right? I would call this an anti-refugee riot. These, these were, mm. this was the, the full pathos of refugees, mm. women and children in particular, and a crowd of, of uh, I don't know, Minutemen, I've, I've, you know, perhaps we can say white trash. Is, is, this, the, to, is this where they turn the bus around? Yeah, the bus. Uh-huh. This is, this, this is a, 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 an obscene uh, spectacle, but again, that just shows the Republican Party hates uh, every uh, everybody California. who's not, yeah. uh, you know, from their their demographic group. So you go through it: Brat, Cochran, Hobby Lobby, Exim Bank, and this thing. Now we've got a series of bills, right? We need them passed. The highway bill, otherwise, there's no highway construction in we the gotta, summer, right? Hundreds need, of thousands we of need this so badly. The farm yeah. bill. The farm bill means food stamps. Otherwise, people starve. Exim as we've just gone through, 250,000 jobs on the line. There is now an attempt to revive the extended unemployment benefits. This is called the uh, Reed, and this is Reed of Rhode Island, R-E-E-D. Reed Heller, Heller mm-hmm. of Nevada. These are mm-hmm. the two states with the highest unemployment. So to get something beyond 26 weeks, there's an attempt to do that. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's the need, obviously, for immigration, some kind of immigration legislation. We can go through that in some detail. Mm-hmm. But also student loans, right? People are continuing to be crushed by student loans. Oh, and the Republican Party is essentially blocking anything on any of this, right? Even mm-hmm. before we get into the details 
of what should be done. Nothing will be done on any of that if you have these lunatic Republicans. So my essential outlook is there must never be another Republican president, because if there is, they will pack the Supreme Court, and you will have the permanent austerity dictatorship. And uh, by that, I mean some of these decisions, not just the Hobby Lobby, but I think also the... um, the decision on the recess appointment. You know, uh, Scalia claims to represent the Constitution. Uh, Scalia's opinion on the recess appointments is that the need for these recess appointments, and I'm quoting, was designed to, the need it was designed to fill no longer exists. And its huh. only remaining use is the ignoble one of en- enabling the president to circumvent the Senate's role in the appointment process. Uh-huh. What he's saying there is that in the olden days, it took a long time to get to Washington, so a recess appointment was okay. But now he's saying it's quaint. This is what these same people said about things like the Geneva Convention, remember? Quaint? Sure. The Geneva Convention yeah, yeah. was quaint. Obviously, mm-hmm. Scalia thinks that the recess appointments are quaint. Look, if that's in the Constitution, there's got to be uh, a, a reason for it. And what they're arguing now is the Senate can simply eternally keep up the pretense that it's never it's never in recess right you can always have these phony sessions and prevent anything from being done so uh who who is the enemy of the constitution here i say it's scalia and i'm amazed that we haven't heard more about impeaching fascist judges you know, you can people can Not remember the impeachable Warren bunker bumper stickers. Nothing. Impeachable Warren, heard. remember? Yeah, I do. Well, I'd like you know maybe we'll start seeing impeach Scalia or impeach the Rats Cabal or just impeach fascist judges. Well, there's a lot of them to go after. That's for damn sure. <laughs> Lots of them. Thank you, Webster. As always, we'll uh, okay. Are we talk out of time? You. Yeah, that's it. Unfortunately, I guess you, we are. You want to pop on later in the month? Just let me know. Well, uh, we've got well, a lot I'd to like cover. To, I'd like to promote some of these uh, meritorious candidates. And again, okay. that's DanForNebraska.com and Credico2014. If you can get word to those people, get your staff uh-huh. or someone, invite them. Let me know, sure. and I'll put, I'll put them, them on. in touch with you. Oh, very good. I'll put them in touch with you. Okay, we'll do it. Okay. Right. Thanks. You take See you care. Soon. Bye-bye.